Welcome to Kingdom Life Church and today's message with Drs. Dennis and Jennifer Clark brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its dedicated supporters. We are here to equip you with the how-to tools and practical effective ways for empowering your Christian journey. Join us as we explore teachings that bring healing through forgiveness and ignite transformation in both individuals and families. For more resources, join our mission. Visit us at forgive123.com. Let's embark on this journey together. Welcome, Kingdom Life Church, Full Stature Ministries. I believe we're continuing on a topic of peace and understanding its significance. We talked about how even the scholars in some of their works do not have an index for peace, like it's meaningless. You know, it's not passive, it's militant. And uh, that is the truth that we're getting through. But... I had a dream. Now, most of my dreams, I wouldn't bother repeating. 99.9% of them, they're not worth it. They don't even make sense. I wake up, I tell Jennifer, and she just laughs. Okay. <laughs> but it's been years since I feel like I've had a, a spiritual dream or vision, uh, and I've had both that were highly significant. But I believe that this last one that I had uh, was very significant. So if you have ears to hear what the Spirit's saying, anoint yourself to say, Lord, help me hear the word of the Lord this morning. But here's the, the, the dream was, uh, and the verse of Scripture that came up was Exodus 14, verses 13 and 14. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of your Lord which will be accomplished for you today. And there was significance when on the dream of today is today. You know, there's various ways of, of looking at that word today. But for the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see no more again. For the Lord is going to fight for you and you will hold your peace or you'll keep quiet. You <laughs> don't talk, hold your peace. Uh, matter of fact, uh, the message translation says, shut up. So you, you do it that what you want. Uh, but anyway, in this dream, God clearly s spoke to me that the old warfare has ended and God's bringing us to a new level. And the phrase that he used in the dream that was so strong was, there, this is the third new beginning. And it was so strong that I said, God, what's the third new beginning? And what he was saying was like, by illustration anyway, only this applies to us personally, I believe, uh, as, as a church, particularly when all the intercession this morning from, from 9 to 9.45 was on greater and lesser knittings, unity, uh, one accord, and much of the intercession around the world has uh, been said by some to not be accomplishing a purpose because coming together in one room does not mean one accord. Saying the same thing does not mean one accord, but it's a horizontal relationship of person to person. The love, love commandment of God is to love God with all your heart and one another. You can't skip the one another. Oh, God I love is these Christians I can't handle. You know, you, that, that really won't cut it, all right? What that's saying is what you, what you have left is not Christianity. What you have left is just dead religion. All right? Oh, just me and God. My, in my era, it was the surfboard Christians. I don't need anybody else. I'm on my surfboard worshiping God. Hopefully they're on the West Coast doing that. But nonetheless, the God said that there's three new beginnings. So I, I looked at even that portion of Scripture uh, where... You will not see the Egyptians no more. And, and actually, I can relate it both in the past. Your salvation experience got you out of the slavery and bondage to the world, didn't it? And they were delivered out of Egypt. But the second beginning or new beginning, the second new beginning for them was the wilderness, where they still had to get Egypt out of them. <laughs> and many died in the wilderness. So there's a transformation that in your new beginning you may or may not apply to it. And the third one, of course, is the promised land. Warfare is never done. There are the ites in the promised land, but what is the old time church used to have an expression 
I never used it, but I can remember hearing it all the time. Uh, higher levels, higher devils. Actually, higher levels, different devils. So it's to me, it's what you, you, your first new beginning needs to bring you to the place to where you deal with the second new beginning, which means forgetting those things which are behind and pressing on to what lies ahead. You cannot bring the old garbage into a new beginning. You can't have a new beginning with old garbage, <laughs> bringing it in. You need those things severed completely and, and, and truly, and we teach how to do that quite effectively. Uh, so what I was looking at was the the... I believe that God said this is the third new beginning for Kingdom Life Church. Third new beginning. So that also means that whatever's transpired in our coming together in unity and everything, it's still got to be purified because here's what I saw. I saw the purging of the old is the same method that we use to get closer to God. And that is, you know, sometimes we pray with people and they say, I'm not getting nothing. What that really means is I didn't sit still long enough because it is absolutely impossible to get nothing. Nothing is impossible with God. I was just playing with that one. Um, but how many, uh, Jennifer knows the science behind this, how many non-conscious thoughts are given at any given second? Approximately a thousand Non-conscious, a thousand conscious. Oh, there we go. A thousand conscious, like I'm hot, I'm cold. How long is he going to preach? You know, <laughs> you know. Those are. There's at least a thousand of those going on in the conscious realm. The non-conscious realm, four hundred billion. So to say, I was praying and I didn't get nothing. You didn't stay there long enough. Because David had the key. David said, Psalm 19, Search me, O God, for secret faults. You want to get on with the new beginning? Then you get rid of the old stuff. And the way to do that is to, the same way you get closer to God is the same way you really need to get rid of the old stuff. You need to immerse yourself. Immerse yourself in His presence, and the light will shine in the midst of darkness. And instead of saying nothing, you know, the, the brighter the light shines, the more you see the particles in the atmosphere even. If God wants you to deal with some of the old particles from the old, from the old life, deal with it. Get it out. Don't do like the children of Israel. They were under slavery. They get into the wilderness with new kinds of trials. And that's what I'm saying. This third new beginning, you're going to be dealing with stuff that you didn't necessarily deal with before. But the fact is, you don't want to bring the garbage of the past in there with it and compound it. People, when they don't deal with that stuff, it's called unnecessary trials and tribulations. How many want that? <laughs> unnecessary trials. In this world, you'll have tribulation. Jesus overcame. But unnecessary trials and tribulations. I don't know about you, but I don't want them. So the same way that I come into the presence of God through immersing myself in his presence is the same way you're going to find out what needs to be left behind. What of the old God had taken you out of, you don't want to go back and take it with you. You don't want to pack, you want to travel light. You want to travel light into the new arena. Now, uh, Matthew 13:52 was a scripture that uh, I think we did it in the other uh, part on Jehovah Shalom. Uh, but in the Amplified, uh, Matthew 13, 52 said, He said to them, Therefore, every teacher and interpreter of the sacred writings who has been instructed about the, and trained for the kingdom of heaven, he has become a disciple, and he's like a householder who brings forth out of his storehouse Treasure that is new, treasure that is old, the fresh as well as the familiar. And what I believe God is saying is that, is that he wants to bring some things out of the tre treasure chest for those who have come together in one accord. And that I want to bring you to a new level. There's a new beginning for you. And that the, uh, what, what did we get in prayer this morning? It's time to take the training wheels off. <laughs> Same difference, really. 
it's time to lay aside. I don't care how well those training wheels work for you and how cool you could ride that bike with the training wheels, how you could stand up and do flips or whatever. The time for the training wheels eventually has to come off and you've got to adjust to a new environment. And uh, the, this, it was so strong that I'm just believing that God's going to do it. He's going to do it, but he's going to, not, he's going to do it for whosoever will. There was also a word this morning about greater and lesser knittings. Lesser knittings, that's a, it's all a matter of choice, isn't it? You can have as much of God as you want. You can be as vulnerable and as transparent as you want. Or you can remain sequestered, secluded to yourself, self-defense, walls. But I believe that God's saying that these same patterns that right now there's an emphasis on purging the old to prepare you for the new. And the purging of the old, like when you get into the presence of God, we, we, we covered these before, and I want you to look at these again and again and take them into your prayer time. Immersion. Immersion. We found that some of the most spiritual Christians from their point of view, they were spiritual and mature. And you know they were spiritual and mature because they would tell you how you, you meet him and say, hi, my name is Dennis, my name is Sally, I'm, I'm spiritually mature. That's usually a telltale sign <laughs> that they're not. <laughs> that means I know my Bible. And that could be a good thing, but that's not spiritual maturity. You cannot be more spiritually mature than your emotions allow you. So if you're not acting in love, joy, and peace, we're not really impressed with your knowledge because you should be expressing the kingdom of God, of love, joy, peace, righteousness, peace, and joy. Righteousness is love and action. Where's the fruit? Okay? So if you are going to learn to deepen that intimacy with God, the first thing you need to do is immerse yourself in his presence. And we saw that when we opened up Tuesday nights. People can't all sit still. And therein lies a key problem. So how do you sit still? Well, I got to do something. I got to pace when I pray. I got to talk when I pray. I can only pray in the tongues. I can only do this. I... Well, what it is is that in sitting still, you quiet that noisy flesh. You wean the flesh from its strength. And those of you that have got a good prayer life, you know when it changes. You close your eyes and the day was kind of frustrating and you, oh, you go, oh boy, I got so much to do today. But then you quiet your flesh until all of a sudden time is, you go from soul time to spirit time. And there's an inner knowing that you, that you broke through the rule of the mind, the will, and the emotions. They are not ruling. They're not, they've not been annihilated, but they're not ruling. They're now being made available for the Jesus in you, like sails, mind, will, and emotions, like a sail. And he wants, to, he wants to breathe and blow the breath of his spirit into those sails to be the motivation in your life. But you have to, like a weaned child with his mother, I quieted my soul within me. You've got to learn how to do that first, or there's no immersion. Immersion means that you don't just go, oh, oh, the water's cold. I, I felt it. I did it. I did it. I'm okay. I'm okay. No, immersion means you choose that desire to be with him. But I'm still saying one of the missing ingredients is understanding power in the church. Signs and wonders affirm God's word. But he also said, did we not cast out devils? Did we not prophesy in your name? Depart from me, I knew you not. A changed life is far superior to what you can do. It's who you are will always be more important than what you can do. A changed life is the power of God. A changed life will speak volumes. A changed life is when strangers notice you're a Christian. It's saying something. When people confront you and say, there's something different about you, there's something, all right? Then you're accomplishing something. That's power. It's not just the signs and wonders. Those, those are valid as well, but without a changed life, kind of meaningless. So immersion, 
starts with a choice, an increased desire. There's five steps here. Uh, I covered this in previous messages, but I really think that if you took this into your prayer chamber, you'd get a lot out of it. Let me give you the five. I'll give you the five in advance. Immersion changes to saturation. Saturation then becomes integration. Integration then is displacement, which is true power, which is true spiritual warfare. You can shout at the dark all you want. You can decree and declare. But until you, within, have light shining in the midst of darkness, you're not displacing much. Displacement. Displacement is true spiritual warfare. It's when that which was within has been laid aside, purged, and made new. I just love the fact that, uh, that there's uh, so much scripture that corroborates the God of peace will crush Satan beneath your feet. So militant. Appeared to weak and wimpy Gideon and called him, oh, mighty man of valor. In order to win a war that came from 300 to win over thousands. And by the way, there was a qualification. You couldn't just all claim it. To come into the kind of unity, there had to be a purging. They must, I like the fact that they were tested by the water. <laughs> You're going to be tested by the water of the word. You're going to be tested by the word that I'm saying today. But I know that dream was valid. And there's a third, there's a third be new beginning for us. Then and that doesn't free you from uh, tribulation and trials, it simply means it's going to change. For whosoever will come together in one accord. So displacement then brings you to a new level and you advance. And Gideon, uh, Jennifer I think mentioned it in the prayer this morning in the intercession, uh, Gideon was instructed by the Lord to put torches in clay pots and at the sound of the trumpet smash the clay pots, light from the torches shined in the midst of darkness, and the enemy, oh, I love that. It's my favorite part of the scriptures. And the enemy turned on itself. It's about time instead of picking on Christians, why doesn't the enemy just turn on himself, right? Light shined in the midst of darkness. Then, years later, in Isaiah, he prophesied of the coming Messiah. And in that Messiah, said, the people who sit in darkness shall see a great light and they shall break the rod of the oppressor as in the day of Midian. So Jesus is going to be the light that shines in the midst of darkness. Jesus is supposed to be the light that shines in the midst of your darkness, whether it's in your heart or your environment, either way. He wants to shine. Now, that in working is to, even to purge the old, is to make a choice that I desire cut ties with any of the old. Well, and that stuff I think I dealt with, I'm not sure. Be sure. I want to take you by a way you've never gone before. And I believe what's going to be changing in the church, in this church particular, and the body at large for whosoever, you know, this won't include everybody. It's just the way it is. People don't all get involved. And that first part, you have to choose, and you have to have a desire, and you can't receive something you're not open to. And you can't give something you don't have. Matter of fact, you ought to ponder just that alone. You can't give something you don't have, but you can't receive something you're not open to, especially if it requires effort. This is not when we travel church to church. That's what Jennifer and I, we had people that wanted one-on-one -on -one appointments that we could have been doing it all day long. But you know what this, and we did, seven days a week. And you know, the, the only qualifying factor was it is we would give some small thing to do in advance. And if they couldn't do small homework, they got skipped. No effort. It was the only thing standing in the way between getting ministry and moving forward and upward was effort. Believe it or not, they shot themselves in the foot just because they couldn't do something simple, like show up <laughs> or something. Really? Well, I always pick on I always pick on Birmingham, uh, Montgomery, Alabama. Was that where we were at? Birmingham, Alabama. Oh, forgive me if you're from Birmingham. 
But we were, we were at a conference of 300 people, and they loved it. It rained the next day, and there was 100 people. <laughs> the third day, the sun came out, and there was 400 people. It's like, did, did rain really stop you? You know, that was, to me, that would have been a, a choice. And, but it also revealed priorities, doesn't it? So do with that what you want, but I'll never forget that. I thought it was. And it was actually a, an African bishop at that meeting who was there all three times <laughs> who actually defined what we did. He had a perception that was, to me, far above a lot of people. Matter of fact, I think there's a version of it on our website right in the introduction. He says, that, uh, I'll mess it up, but it says, uh, Dennis and Jennifer have documented uh, how to, how, how did it go? How to live the Christian life. They have documented it step by step to demystify a walk in the spirit. You know, you can make something so spiritual, so complicated, nobody knows what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Let me read this. I should read what, what's on our website, right? But this, is, this was a, re, a revision of it that this guy said. We teach both new and mature believers how to abide in Christ in a continuing, that's the key word, deeper relationship. Our step-by-step -step approach is based on the simplicity of intimacy with Jesus himself. Oh, this is the part. But it combines both, and this is what he saw, it combines both the God encounter and the process. The God encounter and the process in order to demystify how to live in the Spirit 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Demystify a walk in the Spirit. Even, even our children's books, we can minister effectively to starting as young as age three. I've seen Christian counseling and inner healing all through the body of Christ, and it's so complicated, you have to be an adult to understand it. They made it harder than it has to be. But God wants to demystify and bring it into the simplicity that's in Jesus. If it's too complicated for a child, then maybe it's too complicated for us. That's what I think. Because Jesus wouldn't reject the little children because their intellect wasn't developed enough. I'll tell you what, you tell a little child, snuggle, and they'll understand love. You tell them, giggle, and they'll understand joy, even at an early age. They'll know what to expect and how to anticipate that internal relationship with God can be real. Jennifer's going up. You got, you got some training on Israel for your uh, grandchild in Virginia. And she's going to be going up there this week. She's got books for her that she wrote. By the way, we've got a, not until Jennifer comes back, it'll go to print. But we have a uh, booklet uh, when Jennifer comes back. Be sure to get it. It's uh, the Jewishness of Jesus and the rebirthing of Israel. And it, the booklet would go to press, but she's leaving town. <laughs> so when she gets back, so you only got to wait a week. But I think everybody should keep a copy of that. And, and if nothing else, give it. Give it to children and let them appreciate it at an early age rather than listen to CNN or something. You know. Yeah, four hostages were rescued by the IDF. So we're thankful for that. All right. Now, let's get back into that. Those five elements, if you took them into your prayer life, really what it would be is how the word becomes life in you, and then how it is expressed outwardly. There's both an inworking and an outworking. And it's relationship, relationship, relationship. And it's horizontal as well as vertical. You can't say, I love God, it's these people. It won't work, it won't work. God's not impressed with a relationship that doesn't depict that you actually care about other people. So. The immersion, this is where you choose to receive and quiet that noisy flesh till you meet God. That's the beginning. 
That's just the beginning. The second beginning is acknowledging anything of the old that could possibly bring condemnation and get it washed out and say, I'm moving into the new. I'm not taking that with me. I'm going to now replace lies with truth, replace emotional pain with the fruit of the Spirit. And when you do that, saturate yourself in it. Stay there. Enjoy the joy. Enjoy the peace. And for a, a word like peace that is so militant, the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet, to think that all the great theologians don't even have, well, how did we just read recently? They don't even have an index in some of their study guides for peace, like, it's, well, peace be with you, like it's hello, hi, how are you? It's so rich as far as a lifestyle. And if you don't have peace on something, you don't have Jesus on it. He himself is your peace. So look at those things. So you immerse yourself in God. Uh, Jennifer's word when I was teaching her this, these are consistent ways. This is the, like Moses knew the ways. The people saw the end result. But the people needed to learn the ways like Moses learned. You need to learn the ways. Well, one of the consistent ways that God works <coughs> is that when you get into his presence, you have a capacity to absorb. That was Jennifer's word, absorb. I used to say cherish. Trying to explain something that's going on, sometimes you lack the right word. But for me, it was cherish it. As soon as I felt his presence, I cherished it. Jennifer said, I'm absorbing. You find a word that's real to you, but you need it, and you need more of it. And after that absorbing, how do you know? God always said, Dennis, I'm going to give you a revelation. I'm going to teach you how to do it. But then I'm going to, I'm going to call you on the carpet to see if there's any fruit. That's fair, right? Did it work or not? If it didn't work, then you're just giving lip service to something that you can't live. Revelation, I'll teach you how to apply the revelation. And thirdly, I'm going to ask you if you see fruit. So here's how you'd see fruit. You absorb something until there's a birthing. There's a new attitude birthed on the inside. You become a partaker of the divine nature. Scripture would say, uh, you receive with meekness the engrafted word. Engrafted means you're, you're owning it now. It's in you. It's easier to obey than not to obey. It's, it's part of you. You are a partaker of the divine nature. It's written on the tablet of your heart. Okay, I got it. I got it. It's written on the tablet of my heart. And God says, okay, now prove it. Let's see the fruit. If that truth is written on the tablet of your heart, then it's going to be easy for you to emanate it. It's going to be easy for you to obey it. It's going to be easy for you to be and do all that he called you to be, all that he called you to do. It will become effortless. Because then as you started out unconsciously incompetent, <laughs> I mean, you were incompetent and you didn't even know you were incompetent. To me, this is, the, this is the mystery of the Christian walk. This is the thing that takes the mystique out of it and bring it into reality. All of a sudden, I saw I needed the reality of what I'm reading, not memorizing scripture. I need the reality of that scripture. And so the second step then was I became consciously incompetent. Uh... It was kind of bliss to be unconsciously incompetent. You didn't know. You know, some people live there their whole life, unaware that you are incompetent. How about learning forgiveness? Learning forgiveness. It was too hard. Yeah. A lot. God was teaching me on, on the power that's behind forgiveness. And when I was a baby Christian, I wasn't even spirit filled yet. I just there was a four month period there where I'm going. Man, God, if I have to forgive every dirty thought I have, I ain't got time to do anything. I got to go to work. <laughs> I mean, every second I could think of something bad about me, myself, or God, or somebody else. I'm going, I can't do it. But I'm going to do it. Because I know it's what you want. Because, see, I was raised Catholic. I thought you had to go to the priest to do confession. And I never did it right. 
even in the first grade, second grade, the, the, the goal was if you confess too much, you get too much penance. So you didn't confess everything, but then you went home feeling guilty that you didn't confess everything so that your punishment would be lighter. So, I mean, it was a catch-20. You, you were stuck. So then God teaches me as a new believer that I can go to him and receive this forgiveness and wash clean, and the yuck went. I was shocked. The yuck goes. God said, I don't want nothing to come between what you and I have together. And when you receive forgiveness in your heart, the yuck goes. There's nothing, oh, I forget, uh, the feelings will come later. I just do it by faith. That faith stuff doesn't work if there's no transaction. You're just giving lip service to something. The transaction must take place, and the yuck has to change to peace or nothing really happened. So I'm going, okay, God, I forgive. Uh, i, I got to go to work. I, and I mean, I'm mad at my tools. Can you imagine that, being mad at your tools? That's like kicking the lawnmower. Did that ever work? No. The problem was in me. <laughs> and so I'm going, oh. But then the revelation came, and it was so exciting. All of a sudden, the periods of me needing to forgive got farther apart. What an assurance. It was like, this is working. Well, the, once you tell me something works, forget it. I'm going to be like a dog with a bone. And I'm telling you what, I started walking in a supernatural peace that eventually, like, like we said last week, to where I was working in a halfway house, a guy pulled a knife, and the peace of God increased. And I saw, again, the militancy of the peace of God. But you don't get that without walking a forgiveness lifestyle because that is the love message where the rubber meets the road. If you can't do that, you're, what you're living is not Christianity. Forgiveness lifestyle is the love message. We were told in two accounts of the Gospels, go preach the remission of sin. It's that important. And how do you know if it worked? Peace. Now there's three, we always said there was two answers in this church, that if you don't know what I'm talking about, just say, and I ask a question, just say, peace, forgiveness, and you'll be right 90% of the time. Well, there's a third one now, for me, at least in my house. Peace, forgiveness, and yes, ma'am. <laughs> you get your own third one, I don't know, that's up to you, you go, that's, that's your territory, not mine. But that works for me. Yes, dear. <laughs> Peace, forgiveness, or yes, dear. Now, you may have to develop your own now. This will take time. You'll need a revelation, and then you have to develop that revelation. All right. But, uh, but God is basically taking us to the place where he says, for the church, for Dennis, for Jennifer, and for the church, this is the third new beginning. So that means there's some old stuff that's got to go. Even uh, like Jason shared this morning, even accomplishments. Paul, when he said forgetting those things are behind, he wasn't talking about all the bad stuff. He was talking about even his accomplishments. I consider them nothing compared to the excellency of where I'm going, the things of knowing God. All right. So you make a choice that I'm going to quiet my flesh like a weaned mother with its child. I'm going to give it that effort. Or maybe you don't want to. But if I do... That desire will increase, and you start to see progress. Even if it's gradual, you're going to start feeling better about life in general. And then you start receiving it, and then what happens? You absorb it. You're actually birthing an attitude. Now, when I say an attitude, I'm not talking about mental attitude. When you birth a new attitude, have this attitude that was in Christ Jesus, that was spiritual. It wasn't just thoughts. This attitude that you birth is in the heart. To where it becomes motivation. You're birthing and partaking of the divine nature. It's an engrafted word. It's being written on the tablet of your heart. You're owning it. If you own it, you will express it. And check yourself out to see if you are expressing it. Because anybody can claim a scripture. The question is, are you emanating that scripture? Are you walking it out? Are you living it? Now, after that is birthed, you become a partaker of the divine nature. But here's the part that we're trying to cover in this series on peace, which we haven't gotten to yet. 
By the way, today's message is called Becoming a Kingdom Peacemaker. And you're going, you haven't heard anything about peacemaking yet. No, we're getting there. All right. But after you've had that burst of revelation to where you own it, and it's written on the tablet of your heart, this is the important part to get. Don't say peace or forgiveness. The important part to get on this is your value system now. It's not just scriptural, it's God himself. Because you got the living word. This is the living word being made life in you, Zoe, God kind of life in you. So what you've got now as your, uh, and we've said it again and again, peace is not an it. Peace is not something. He himself is our peace. It's a person. And from that place of personhood, you are now connected. Now here's the way it's going to work out of your life if you really did it. Remember we said test the fruit. Here's a revelation. Here's how you develop the revelation. And here's how it would look if it's true. If there's fruit in my life over that truth. It becomes my value system, becomes God himself. The connection is we. It's no longer me doing for God. It's a we mentality. It is God who is at work to will and to perform. It is God who is at work in you to will and to perform. To will and to perform. So if you're not, if you do anything apart from that new creation reality, you're on your own. That's that independent spirit that thinks it's doing all the right stuff. But it's not an independent spirit that glorifies God. It's God who is at work in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory, the we aspect of the reality of that relationship. Now, that becomes the attitude that was in Christ Jesus. And that attitude becomes a motivation. Remember we said, uh, soak in God reality, God initiative, God provision. You want to see the provision, you see the initiative, and it, let God be the one instigating it or initiating it. Your, your, your motivation is now God. It's the love of God because he has no other motive. And ultimately, it results in your behavior. Ah, huh. so people could actually even see it by observation. You need to know it by revelation. But they can actually see it by observation because it should affect your behavior. If it doesn't affect your behavior, you didn't pass the test. Whatever you thought you were doing, it didn't work. It didn't take. All right? So now, becoming a kingdom peacemaker. And I'm going to emphasize these... these um, Four points. No more than a couple minutes on a point. Or just for the people that are losing their peace. <laughs> you want to see you lose your peace? Uh, there's 33 examples that I'm going to give you. And they go, <coughs> example one. And then you go on for two hours. And they're, they're all going to go, 32, 32 more. <laughs> okay. See, I've been doing this a long time. I know I uh, I can discern you people. <laughs> you know, believe it or not, in my first church, it's probably about 250 people, and by discernment, I learned to utilize my discernment while I was preaching. I could feel when I'm talking, and all of a sudden, somebody in the back goes, eh, which usually means I don't understand that or I don't agree with it. And I used to purposely, not point it out, but I would purposely repeat myself and explain it. There's a, that's a loving value to discernment. Now, peace is a person. Peace, shalom, completeness, wholeness, peace, health, healing, welfare, safety, salvation, deliverance, soundness, tranquility, prosperity, perfectness, fullness, rest, harmony. Raise your hand if you don't want any of this. Um, unity, absence of agitation or discord, total well-being, and as our friend Bill Morford did in his uh, One New Man Bible while he was in our church, it was fun having a scholar in your church because every now and then I'd say something and he'd be in the back of the room going, 
<laughs> and to this day, we endorsed his, his commentaries. And he says, and Dennis Clark trusts the peace of God more than all the reason he put together. And he was a scholar scholar. Many of you probably have his Bible, the One New Man Bible. He studied under uh, Eliezer Ben Yehuda's great grandson. 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 Oh, that was the man that brought Israel language back to Israel, the Hebrew language. And uh, he studied under them. I thought it was, uh, it was fascinating, though. I, I just loved that. That was good for me to have something in the back all like that. I didn't need discernment. He called it. He's the one that I learned what to do if you don't have good discernment. He says, my wife's got really good discernment. I don't. Great scholar, but I don't have good discernment. My wife does. So he said they agreed that green light, red light, yellow light. If she gets a green light and he's got a red light, they have to pray longer. <laughs> Until there's either two red lights or two green lights. That's wise. That's good. That's good. Good practice. Because sometimes we 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 think it's discernment, but it's, we just judge our prejudice. I did that once when I prayed for somebody, and they went down in the spirit, and there was a pastor in the room, and as soon as that guy went down in his gut, he went. <clears throat> so I said, "You didn't witness that, did you?" He goes, "No, I didn't." Well, I did. I could feel the Holy Spirit doing it. But what you called a bad witness was a prejudice. Think about it. Everybody who doesn't believe in speaking in tongues, if they hear tongues down here, they go, eh. they get a bad witness. It doesn't fit their theology, but it doesn't make them right. You've got to know the difference between a judgment and discernment. Two different things. The wise people will say, God, is that you? Show me. Wisdom searches out a matter. Okay. So peace is a person. I really am going to cover these quickly. All right. And my favorite statement that Bill Morford had was, as far as the definition of shalom, he had all the standard uh, words for the definition, but all things intact, nothing missing. I want that for a congregation. They don't have to be perfect people. But all things are intact. There's nothing missing. We have the wholeness. We have the, the one accord. Now, may the God of peace himself. Oh, my goodness. Peace is in Scripture all over the place, and we treat it as a nothing. May the God of peace sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless. For he himself is our peace, Ephesians 2.14. What that is showing you, the God of peace, that even there there's a, there's, there's a beginning that I'm talking about that God says, thus saith the Lord, Kingdom Life Church, you're entering into a, the third new beginning. Well, here's a third beginning right there. The God of peace, that's actually level three. Because when you got saved, you made peace with God. When you ask Jesus to come in and there's a transaction, you made peace with God. But now you are required to live it out as a Christian with the peace of God. That means he has to rule. Let the peace of God rule. When Jesus is ruling, peace is ruling. When you lose your peace, Jesus is still wanting to rule, but you decided to go on your own. The peace of God rules. But what God is looking for, for a church, that the God of peace that will crush Satan beneath your feet, that you walk in that kind of a revelation of that reality, that your peace is conquering the, the things of the world. He overcame the world, but he overcomes under authority. For it, Let the peace of God rule. Now, when that guy pulled a knife on me in that halfway house and peace increased, and I refused to do what he was telling me to do, I was obeying God rationally, I'd say, get out of the way. Stupid, don't be stupid. Don't stand with somebody holding a knife and then you don't, you don't do nothing. Logic would say, get out of the way. Call the police later if he's making a break for it from the halfway house. But nonetheless, what God was showing me was the militancy of God and that, guess what? The peace of God 
surpasses your understanding. That, at that moment, it surpassed my understanding, but it taught me that the God of peace is what we should be pursuing. Not just peace with God, that's when you confess your sin. The peace of God is something you enjoy when you know that you're walking to the best of your ability with him. But the God of peace is the militant aspect. And so I believe the dream that I had this week about the third new beginning, that we're going to see more of the God of peace. And, but it's required to be in one accord to see it in its fullest. You know the armor of God, put on the helmet of salvation? That's a cor <laughs> corporate armor. I know you teach the kids to do the helmet, and the whole, but it was intended for the church to put on the corporate armor. Corporate. People don't like corporate. People have this rugged individual, independent self that they embellish as really idolatry. Just me and my surfboard, you know. Okay, so peace is a person, and the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. It's the government of peace, of the increase of his government and his peace. A light shines in darkness. This Messiah is being prophesied in Isaiah. Jesus is coming, and he's going to be a light that shines in the darkness. He's going to be the light of the world. It's going to displace the darkness. And of the increase of his government and peace, there is no end. It's going to increase. It needs to increase, but it's going to increase through you. It's not just falling out of the sky. Do you want it to increase in you? Do you want to enjoy the peace? I led a little girl at the grocery store to the Lord, and her husband was Buddhist. And she said, as soon as she asked Jesus to come in, I said, he'll forgive you of your sin. She goes, really? Would he do that for me? And I said, he most certainly will. Let's do it. She did it. She goes, oh, this is real peace. My husband talks as a Buddhist about peace, but he doesn't have any. Good observation, huh? He talks of peace. You know, some of these other religions, they talk about peace, but they don't have any. I once counseled a, a, a guy that was a Mooney, me and a police officer, a Christian police officer. We met with him in a restaurant. We sat down next to him, and he was like this. I got the peace of God. I'm working for God. I got the peace of God. I'm going, I mean, you didn't need the sermon. To say, I don't know what you're calling peace. But he was into hyperactivity to the point where he wasn't even getting sleep. But he had peace. Peace of God. It's amazing. Isn't it how deceived a person can be about what they have and what they don't have, what they need and what they don't need? So God's saying this warfare peace displaces. Did you remember that in the first five steps? Displacement. That's spiritual warfare. That's the ability when something in you has been displaced, removed. I, I, hear, I hear definitions by pastors even on, on forgiveness that just make me cringe. I go, just forgive by faith, the feelings will come later. What that means is you, the, there was no transaction from the heart. When you got saved, it was instant, and it's still instant. You just don't know how to do it from the heart. Forgiveness from the head doesn't work. There's a transaction. If it doesn't change the peace, you didn't do it. The feelings will come eventually. You know what that tells me? It tells me that most of what they probably walked in forgiveness was by accident. They probably did some good stuff by accident. Fortunately, it's a good accident, but it tells me if you can't, if you come up with that kind of a conclusion, I don't, I don't trust your fruit. And I'm allowed to be a fruit inspector because I have to do it in my own life. I'm looking for fruit. I don't care about your biblical knowledge if you can't live it. Right? All right. So this government of peace of which God expand, expects it to expand. So yes, the beautiful thing about this supernatural peace is it's instantly available, but it's also your future. That covenant of peace is not going to be it's forever, 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 forever. Power peace. We have one of our books, The Supernatural Power of Peace. Victory must be 
establish with you must win the battle within before you win any kind of battle without. I see Christians doing intercession. Their life is a mess. I don't have any confidence in all your decrees and declarations if your life's a mess. Win the battle within and have more anointing to move in the battle without. To rule on earth means your kingdom come, your will be done on earth through us. <laughs> that peace, the shalom. The God of peace will bring his rule by establishing his covenant. He made that covenant and he wants to establish it, but he needs people who will be covenant-keeping people who say, yes, Lord, I will obey. I will allow you to be Lord of my life. And I will know if that revelation is true because I'll have peace. And it'll surpass my understanding in a lot of cases. It's like, did you, did you know, I've, I, I've seen people who lost loved ones at the funeral and were apologizing because they felt peace. God was trying to comfort them with the supernatural power of peace. And they were apologizing. People are going to think I didn't care because <laughs> I've got so much peace. Let them think what they want to think. Hopefully they don't say nothing. <laughs> don't comment at funerals. Like, I think what God is doing, no, don't, 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 don't do that. I've had to pick up the aftermath of that stuff. <laughs> now, the God of peace brings his rule on the earth through us. The second thing is it's a plan. So it's a person, it's a plan, it's a place, and it's a purpose, and I'm going to cover these quickly for the benefit of those who are getting antsy. All right. The peace is a plan. Uh, pursue peace with all men, peace with self. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies be at peace with him. Jennifer learned that as a young baby Christian, didn't she? she was, uh, her, her late husband was an unbeliever, abusive, and she would tell God on him all the time. God, look what he's doing. Look, did you hear what? Did you not? And God says, he gave her the scripture in Proverbs 16, 7. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies be at peace. And she just started releasing forgiveness to him instead of pointing the finger. Like God doesn't know. It's like Christians who tell God their whole situation. Like he don't know. <laughs> I know God knows what I'm doing right or wrong because he says, my thoughts are continually towards you. They're more numerous than the grains of the sands of the sea. I don't think you're going to hide. Not well anyway. Now, the plan that God has is that, and we said it before, a kingdom environment is what we're looking to believe in that third level that God gave me in that dream. A kingdom environment means that there's a greater victory over the world of flesh and the devil and that you will become a son of peace. Luke 10, 6 says, if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you. You can't make somebody get saved. You can preach the remission of sin. You can offer the peace that would surpass their understanding if they would accept Jesus, but if they don't, it's, it's, it's back on you to do it again. Can't, you can't give something you don't have, but if you have it and they don't receive it, you, that's their business. You need to be available. The kingdom people are identified by fruit, therefore by their fruits you will know them. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy. Kingdom people have a divine ability to perform. Kingdom people bring the increase of God's rule of peace. Kingdom people are commissioned to bring that peace to bear on those who need the same. The God of all comfort. Comfort them, my people. Comfort them with the same comfort whereby you've been comforted. Well, if you haven't been comforted, you don't really have anything to give anybody. If you don't have victory in your life, you don't really have much to offer someone else. Kingdom people are planted within. They're the planting of the Lord. They're to be trees of righteousness. Their roots are to go down deep into Him, rooted and grounded in Him. All right? So peace is a person, peace is a plan, peace is a place. And it's with you. It surpasses all understanding. The God of peace will be with you all. The things which you have seen, look at Paul. Kind of, it almost sounds like he's bragging, but he's not. The things which you've learned and received and heard from me, these you do, and the God of peace will be with you. Wow. I think the, the thing that is the most exciting is that he's available instantly 
and he's, his mission is to expand forever. Peace is available instantly for whosoever, but it's going to expand forever. And that covenant of peace is forever. Amen. So let's go for more, right? Let's enter into, as a church, that third level, that third new beginning. And remember, they were delivered from slavery and they got a new beginning. They were delivered from slavery, but that new beginning put them in the wilderness to where the junk showed up, any Egypt left in them showed up. Some don't cut it because they won't deal. They're listening to Mr. Rogers more than they're listening to the Bible. You know, Mr. Rogers says, I like you just the way you are. That appeals to a lot of people. Because <laughs> then you don't have to change anything. Mr. Rogers loves you just the way you are. Okay. But anyway, the, uh, this piece, if you're going to say I do to it today, I'm going to ask you to pray with me. And if you're watching my video, pray with me today to say I do. I do. I want to enter into a relationship with God, just like you say in a marriage ceremony. I want to reestablish that covenant of peace. I do. I do. Here's a good way to remember it. Intimacy. I. D. Dependency. O. Obedience. You say I do to the Lord. You're, you're, you're requiring intimacy, dependency, and obedience to him from this day forward. I covenant with you this day to enter into a supernatural peace of God that goes beyond my understanding. I am opening up my heart of faith to receive what I don't have in the realm of peace and God himself, God himself is my peace, has a plan for my life and he wants me to not only have the God of peace to crush the enemy beneath my feet but the God of peace is going to be extended like a river. It's my purpose to be a son of peace. My, the angels preached peace, goodwill toward men, peace on earth. That's because a son of peace. How beautiful are the feet of them who preach the gospel of peace. Sons of peacemakers. Now the fruit of righteousness, obeying God's will and the fruit of the Spirit, is sown in peace to those who make peace. This is actually teaching us how to become kingdom peacemakers. And peacemakers, don't let that term fool you. you. You have gotten quite good at waging war. You cannot be a peacemaker until you've entered into an understanding that warfare is displacement. You don't just shout at demons. You don't just stab them. They don't bleed. They don't die. You have to bring the greater one into that arena in your presence, not just in your words, but in your heart. You come into that arena and you decree and declare with that arena, you've got God himself in agreement with you. And in one accord, it's multiplied. And God's bringing us to the place of one accord. The third new beginning begins in Kingdom Life Church this Sunday, as of today. And that we're going to be a kingdom of peacemakers. And remember, if you never know the answer, and anyone in this church asks you a question, you say, peace or forgiveness? In my house, it's peace, forgiveness, and yes, dear. <laughs> you do what works for you. So, Father, peace is our purpose. We're going to be peacemakers from this day forward. And there's a third element God's going to have us enter in. Remember the first element, get them out of, his, out of Egypt. The second element, got to get them out of the wilderness. Not all of them survived the wilderness even because of criticism, Stuff that God hated, the deadly seas, comparing, coveting, criticizing, controlling. Ugh, they died. But the next, the next realm is the promised land. And guess what? Even in the promised land, you're going to have the ites. It's going to be a new strategy, but it's a new day, and it's a new beginning. So let's learn the warfare the proper way, through displacement by the supernatural peace of God. I am a peacemaker, I shall be a peacemaker, and so shall you whosoever will. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Thank you for joining us. 
You've been listening to Drs. Dennis Clark and Jennifer Clark from Full Stature Ministries. To explore more life-transforming resources and deepen your faith journey, please visit us at forgive123.com and our online school at teamembassy.com. All rights reserved under applicable law. For details, please see our copyright policy on our website. Again, that's forgive123.com.